Good morning, this is Tom Prendergast. I'm the author of uh, this book um, about my uh, walk with the Holy Spirit from this way back at the age of two. Uh, I've decided to narrate the story because there's a lot of people today who are real media oriented. You know, reading is becoming a lost art. Um, I'm 61 years old, so, you know, reading is still a sport I like to engage in, but I know that the uh, younger generations really want to be fed uh, by video, which, you know, it's a trend. So what do you do? You can either rebel against it or you can abide by it, get the message out there. This message is very important, and the reason why it's so important is I want people to know that there are certain people that the Lord reveals himself to for whatever reason the Lord has deemed uh, important to do. I happen to be one of those people. It doesn't mean I'm any more important than anybody else. What it does mean, though, is the message and what I have to share here is important for you to know that uh, I am of sound mind. Um, I am a responsible father. I've raised great children. I'm still raising children. I'm married. Um, I run several businesses very successfully. Uh, you would say that I'm probably one of the more stable people that you've ever met. I have a great sense of humor. I'm active. Uh, I'm really, I mean, I'm engaging with people. I'm empathetic. I care about people. In fact, the, the companies that I run are philanthropic in that uh, we give all away a lot of things that I could sell and make a lot more money, but I don't. Um, I tied a lot of my money to uh, missionaries and outreach programs and, and orphanages and stuff, and I help a lot of people to get back up on their feet. Um, so, without further ado, let's get this narration started. God loves us and offers us a way to become worthy. This is my story. This is my testimony. I have been blessed with the knowledge of my own experiences with the spiritual war that rages around us. I have been blessed to know the Holy Spirit from the beginning of my life. I have been blessed to witness a miraculous healing. I have been blessed to be aware of and engaged in the removal of demons. I have been blessed to be thrown down hard and restored from that destruction. I have been blessed with visitations, visions, and miracles of answered prayer. I have been blessed to see and recognize the end of the church age. If all of this was for any singular moment, that moment is today for you and I will do my best to share this with you. The magnitude of my relationship with biblical events, Holy Spirit engagement in my life is huge and minuscule and vast in scope all at the same time. I have had to condense it to a Reader's Digest version so I could produce this fast enough for you so the letter or article or book is timely and this year, not a decade from now. So for you, here is the Reader's Digest version of my walk with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now to note, this, the making of this small book, I think it's more apropos, uh, has been in the works for many years, that it's been on, on me, laid on me to, to write this down. Uh, what it will become is probably my, my autobiography because my autobiography, the core of it, is going to be God, Yahweh, Yahshua, Jesus, or the, you know, the Savior, the Holy Spirit, has been involved in me throughout everything I do. Um, uh, I'm, I'm like always in constant fellowship. I'm always talking, meditating, uh, my decision making, the things that I do, for the most part, are focused on and inspired and um, about the Lord. Now, it doesn't mean I'm, I'm perfect, I'm far from it. I mean, I've struggled with drinking, I've quit drinking, I struggle with smoking, I've quit smoking, I struggle with my anger still, and I struggle with my tongue having profanity and cursing, uh, another one of my uh, things that I struggle with, but I do repent and work at it very hard if that makes sense. Anyway, back to the book. At the very earliest of memory, at the age of two and a half years, I had my first Holy Ghost visitation. Not a dream, mind you, but an actual event, one that imprinted on me so strongly that its memory is as crisp today as it was moments after it happened. 
At that time, and for some time, I did not know this was a Holy Spirit visitation, but after growing old and having many other Holy Spirit visitations, and my lifetime of spiritual battles, revelations, etc., as you will read about, I can look back and know with absolute certainty that this is my first memorable visitation. I was two and a half years. It was a summer day, and I was in my crib and awake. The room was filled with a wondrous golden light, similar to an afternoon sun setting light, but it glowed from within everything. The air had a smell that I can only be vaguely described as that of ivory soap and two bros. It is an incredible fragrance and overwhelmingly beautiful. If love had a smell, this was it. The moment also had such keenness to it as if time had stopped. As I stood there, I distinctly remember laughing out loud as I held onto the crib railing and jumped up and down in total ecstasy. It was 1956. The place was Jackson, Michigan on Springfield Street. We were to be moving to San Diego later that year. My next Holy Spirit visitation was at the Sleep Inn on Garnet Avenue and Mission Bay Drive in San Diego. I was now three years old, or so I am assuming, as we moved to San Diego in September the month I turned three. Again, this is a memory I remember as clearly as if it had happened yesterday. My parents, an older brother and sister, were at the restaurant and left me to nap. I awoke while they were away and wandered into the bathroom looking into a mirror and remember clearly the bathroom had blue tile, a bluish green paint. The bathtub had a shower curtain with blue and yellow flowers on it and I was gazing at the door mirror when the air turned golden. The smell was that ivory soap tube rose fragrance and an overwhelming feeling of well-being filled me. It was timelessness, and I remember tears in my eyes from being so overcome by this love. After that, things pretty much settled into a childhood of little note until the tribulations began and my focus on God and discovery of my artistic talents, that being in about fourth grade or when I was around eight years old, I started having prophetic dreams. I also started painting biblical scenes as I found myself drawn to these events, like Moses and the bulrushes. You see. This is a note in here. My dad had this really cool Bible. It was the only Bible in the house. Now, don't get me wrong. My, my family I grew up in were seculars. They went to church maybe on Christmas and Easter, and that was it. They went to an Episcopalian church. Uh, we never talked about God. We never read the Bible. Our prayers at dinner were the, you know, the typical, uh, my Father out in heaven, thank you for this food, and bless it, amen. Nothing, there was no real... <laughs> I didn't know. I mean, I, I was drawn to God, but I, I grew up in a kind of a godless family. I think most people can relate to that in the United States. So, but my dad had this Bible, and I came across it. Well, what was really great about this Bible is it actually had these, like, classic 17th century color plates of oil paintings of uh, Moses and the bulrushes, the Sermon on the Mount, John the Baptist, the crucifixion, etc., and, that, and then that, that inspired me, and so I made paintings of this. And the paintings that I did were like, you know, three by four. So I did one painting, I think it was uh, uh, John the Baptist. It was like six foot by eight foot, or four foot by eight foot. I did on a, on a piece of sheetrock. And um, I kind of was discovered by several of my teachers who brought me home. And this, I'm still on a side note here. Uh, I may even cover this later in this in this in this book, but Mr. Alcoin brought me home to tell my parents that I was like this really incredible child prodigy artist, and that they should do everything in their power to get me, you know, formal training because I was probably going to be one of the, you know, our our generation's greatest artists. Well, when he he left, my dad promptly took me out to the garage and beat the crap out of me. Um, I, was, I should say snot. Uh, because there wasn't any way his son was going to be some stupid starving artist. That's a whole other story, those struggles. Anyway, uh, I produced and was considered a child prodigy because these paintings were of the level of a mature artist with the command of anatomy. And I mean seriously, command of the anatomy. I, I, I had figured out and I was able to do hands as well as any artist. Foreshortening. Uh, there's a thing called the golden section. I intuitively knew about the golden section. I didn't know it was called that, but my paintings in, engage that. So I mention this because I believe I have been called to Jesus since before being born. I mean, it's just Jesus, my love of God, my focus on it, my recognition, it just, it just permeates me. Now, I'm 
you know, I'm a healthy guy, mentally and physically, in sound mind and body. It's just that I have been injected and infused with the Holy Spirit. But it was also at this time we were doing the air raid sirens. So, so you know, this is during the Cuban thing, Cuban Missile Crisis. So we were doing duck covered school, and Kennedy was starting down the you know, staring, standing down the Russians, and many feared a nuclear war. And then there's the Kennedy assassination. So you can imagine uh, that this is pretty stressful for an eight-year-old kid. I mean, it could have been six, seven, eight. I had what I still refer to as prophetic dreams during this time. And I still do. Uh, they were about red moons, famines, wars, and strife, and rioting, and burning homes and stores. They also included huge, distant, thundering flashes of light, hurricane-type winds, and total destruction, leaving behind a smoking Martian-like landscape, with smoking and burning, with great suffering. These became reoccurring dreams for about 10 years. Oh yes, and the tsunami dreams too. Now, seriously, there's a new movie that just that's coming out. That I've just recently seen the uh, previews. It's called San Andreas. Those the pictures of those tidal waves there, those are exactly what I've seen as a kid. And, 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 and even young adult, and occasionally to this day, you know, I've seen the tidal waves in the other movies like 2012 and, you know, the one about the meteor striking and all that. Those, weren't, those didn't really fit the, the visions that I've seen in the dreams. But, those, the, but the, the new one, San Andreas, where these waves are coming in through the, the Golden Gate, that I'd look at that. I had to look at it over and over again. Eerie, eerie. So these dreams is where I was frozen at the beach, unable to move from fear as huge thousand-foot waves approached, threatening total annihilation. And I always thought thousand-foot waves was you know unrealistic. That would never happen. Well, you know, as I've gotten older and history and stuff, it's not unusual. Uh, tsunamis can be that high or even higher. I still have these dreams occasionally to this day. Interesting, since I was at one point a big wave surfer, uh, a note to that, um, I've always been attracted to the ocean. I'm a certified diver. I've, I've owned a sailboat. I've, I've, I've raced sailboats, Hobie cats, monohulls, large sailboats. I've even sailed in a hurricane uh, down in the Caribbean. Um, surfing, I started surfing at a very young age and I, I got up to the point where I was a big wave surfer, you know, 30 plus wave, waves like you see in Mavericks. The ocean is in my blood, and I am drawn, and always will be drawn, to the oceans. Yet I live in Wyoming. How weird is that? Why? Because it became heart, heavy on my heart, and I was called and directed through, you know, the spiritual connection to live where I live in Wyoming, out in the middle of nowhere. Now, I like living here. It's secluded. It's quiet. I get to do a lot of prayers. But honestly, I miss the ocean terribly. And I'm seriously considering moving into the southern, uh, the southern part of South America down near Uruguay because I want to get back to living near the ocean. So, at the age of 12, my parents got divorced. That was a tough time. We moved from our comfortable middle-class home into an apartment. It was at this time the UFOs started to appear to me. Mostly small trapezoid, fluorescent, blue-shaped moving objects in oblique directions as they zoomed around on the horizon within my sight from my perch on the second-story bedroom where I spent a good year restricted to my dad by the evil, wicked stepfather. I also witnessed UFOs while at the beach and in the ocean as I started surfing at a very young age as the ocean is in my blood. Junior high and high school were very turbulent. My stepfather took to beating me and sexually assaulting me from 8th grade to the summer before 10th grade. At that time, I shot him during one of his drunken assaults on me with my spear gun. You know, I had a spear gun because I was into the ocean and diving. I did this after he had beaten my mom, knocking her through a play class window. Now, you can imagine being, you know, 12, 13 years old, uh, watching this raging monster hitting your mother in the face with a fist pounding on her holding her neck and then throwing her into the plate glass window where she broke through it and lacerated and blood gushing everywhere I got to see that lucky me and at the same time 
I also knew, because my sisters were telling me, that he was molesting them, one of them being my, my real baby sister, along with his daughters. This man was evil. I had to run away, because otherwise I was going to murder him, and at the, even at that young age, I knew I did not want to live with that legacy. He deserved it. I just didn't want to be the guy who delivered it. I still feel a little bit of guilt of leaving my sister behind, but she was invited to come with me, and she didn't. So, it was 1967. I was 14 years old, summer of love, and I packed up my clothes and walked 10 miles to Highway 15, put out my thumb, and began the adventure of being a runaway. I thought I was headed to San Francisco to be a hippie. Yippee! But common sense stopped me to go to my dad's in Orange County. He convinced me to stay with him, along with my stepmom, Patricia. She made a big difference in my life. I was seriously damaged, and she helped ease the pain, and she taught me confidence, and she helped me heal. So I entered into high school with a new family, and during high school became the prima donna, with grade scores reaching nearly straight A's, and my illustrious artistic ability blossoming. I became a proud man of the flesh, the darling of high school academia the recipient of many art awards for excellent throughout the state. I was warned by several friends who were Christians that I was in trouble, but I ignored them. After all, I was Tom the Magnificent. I had women, or young girls at that time, throwing themselves at my feet. I could go and do anything I wanted. I even dabbled in their churches, but was not willing to embrace. Church seemed so hypocritical with the history of violence and wars, or so I thought in my ignorance. I was about to fall, and I did. Right out of high school, in my first year in college, I went to a big party in the hills of Orange County, Loma Linda. I was there with a hot chick, of course. Everyone knew me. I was the number one high school artist in California. I was a confident, competent surfer. My hair was blonde, you know, bleach blonde from the sun, and the, and the, and the, uh, and the, and the, the seawater. And I was a straight-A student. I was way too cool, and I was way too drunk. I was also selling pot on the side and smoking that, too. I really was a jerk. Someone whipped out a bunch of Coke. It was not Coke, but that is what this guy named TR said it was. And everyone snorted up, including me. Why? Because I was stupid and drunk. What it really was, no one knows for certain. It wound up killing over 40 people. I survived, but it was like taking a thousand hits of LSD mixed with angel dust and strychnine. I literally lost my mind. This event took years to recover, and I still suffer from some of the damages to this day. I'm going to insert a note here. Uh, those damages today are, when I, I get tired, I start stuttering. Uh, back then, when it happened, I stuttered so bad I couldn't even communicate with you. Once I finally started to be able to talk, um, there was a couple of things I've meditated on looking back at that. I remember the following morning after the cops, everybody had come, or what, you know, there had been a lot of activity and it kind of like settled down, and then a lot of the people who overdosed on this drug had wandered off. It was in Loma Linda, it was up in the, the hills. And they had kind of wandered back into the house, I guess, because my recollection is totally tweaked. But I do recall the visual images as if they happened yesterday. And this is what's unique. Everything I looked at, all the people walking around, and even I looking into the mirror, I didn't look like me. I looked like demons, you know, like UFO aliens. It was like we were all really weird ugly aliens now this could have been the hallucinations i just want to put it point it in here that this is one of those things i forgot to write about in this that uh i believe this was actually a demonic event anyway i have distinct memories more like snapshots after the event the last thing i remember before the cocktail took effect was snorting up those lines sitting in my dots in 2000 sports car with my date then bam blank. She told me much later what happened. She said I was talking to her, then just stopped talking, stared at her drooling, then went into convulsions, tore off my shirt, and ran off into the woods. She said others did similar things. Many people fell down and died. The police finally came. A lot of people went away in ambulances. I only know what she told me. 
I found myself wandering that morning in the woods. Remember being in some small trailer or house and looking into a mirror and what looked back at me still causes my heart to tremble. It was the most heart-stopping, fearful-looking demon that stared back at me. Today I'm convinced that is exactly what I did see. The next two weeks I survived on the streets of Orange County, living on rooftops, eating from garbage cans and dumpsters. I had no inner voice. I was literally a wild animal. I only have visionary flashes during this time, sleeping under a truck, curled up in a dumpster, running from people, living on top of a roof in an industrial complex. As time moved on, I found myself walking in a neighborhood that I recognized all of a sudden, and that I was, in fact, naked and caked in filth with matted long hair wrapped with an old dirty sleeping bag wrapped around me. Well, the remnants of a sleeping bag wasn't the whole thing. I am sure the neighbors were terrified to see me. As my first thought floated to the surface of my wrecked brain, and it said, Well, Tom, now you have done it. You're going to have to learn to live with this. As I continued my pace, mind you, I was still hallucinating, but not as severe. But to explain my visuals at this time, each step I took, looked like millions of miles of sidewalk passed below me and it was a continuous struggle to just keep from falling down from the vertigo and trails I was envisioning. But I kept walking, annoyingly headed home to my dad's on Spruce Circle in La Palma. Then the next comment came from my inner voice. I had a thought. I can hear myself again. Maybe I'm going to be okay. I actually got tears. I get tears today when I even think about it. It was really, it was like being saved. Then I recognized my dad's house, knocked on the front door. It probably must have been a Saturday, because after being physically and verbally abused by my dad, um, you know, he opened up the door, looked at me, called me some names, and then punched me in the face, <laughs> knocked me to the ground. My mom, my stepmom, uh, Patricia, stepped in and took me in, cleaned me, and looked after me. Uh, a few weeks later, I managed to get a job sanding aircraft antennas, and when I got my first check, I bought a bus ticket to Santa Cruz and wound up living in a chicken coop in a redwood stump way in the backwoods above Boulder Creek as I recovered. Now, the reason why I went to Boulder Creek up in the Santa Cruz Mountains is because across the street from me on Spruce Circle in La Palma, there was a girl that lived there named Lita, Lita Bond. And Lita Bond and I had a little romantic... Uh, uh, venture while she lived there then she and her dad her stepdad bill and her mom and her sister and stuff moved from there moved up to uh, santa cruz which is in northern california she had heard what happened to me she contacted me and she talked me into coming up there i couldn't talk so anyway i well, so i wound up living in the backwoods above boulder creek as i recovered this was a period of two to three years it took that long to learn how to speak again not much occurred as far as visitations or visions. Perhaps the entire story is a miracle that I lived, survived, and recovered. I suffered severe brain damage. To this day, I still stutter occasionally or lose complete thoughts in midstream. Now, let's talk about this. The type of brain damage that I have is the kind of cogni cognitive brain damage where your brain actually rewires itself. Um, I'm not psychosomatic. I'm not schizophrenic. I'm not sociopathic. I, it was more like uh, along the lines of a, a brain injury that you'd get like in a car where, where your head was crushed in or broken in. Uh, and then the, the miracle of the brain, it rewires itself. So, and you're, you're listening to me talk. I mean, I, I am fully recovered and I do have my full facilities, but I am a completely different person. It did change my personality. From reports of old friends that survived that party, over 30 people went to mental hospitals you know what they say about mental hospitals. Once you check in, you don't us usually don't check out. And so, as far as we know, they're still there. <laughs> that experience also humbled me for a time. Yet my ego was to rise again, like a phoenix, as I recovered. This was the beginning of my Santa Cruz era. During that time, after the first three years up in the mountains, I slowly got back into my artwork, albeit... It was totally changed, and I remember the day as clear as if it was yesterday, the day I sat down and applied pencil to paper, and a real awesome drawing emerged. I was thankful, and I cried and wept that day, and thank God that my talent, though different, was restored. I, was all, I have always felt the presence of God, and occasionally can see His influence on molding me. And usually looking back, 
The drug overdose changed me to the core. It is nearly impossible for me to explain the absolute pure fear I experienced in that depth of that overdose. The best way to explain it is the snow that old TV showed when there were no channels. That was the state of my mind, and the only thing that kept me company during those two weeks was that pure adrenaline-driven fear. I can safely say I know fear. However, I still had much to learn, and the flesh is powerful. My recovery became a lifetime pursuit. As I began to assimilate back into society, I buried myself into surfing. Santa Cruz big wave cold water surfing. And I got good at that. I mean, I got really good. I also moved forward with my artwork, and I got really good at that too. Started making decent money and making a lot of new friends, surfers, and artists, which also included alcohol, pot smoking, coke snorting, staying up to all hours of the night, and all the temptations that went with it. I joined a band, and at the older spectrum of my 20s was pretty much back to that prima donna status as I became the famous and very financially rich, extremely arrogant ass pot rancher in the late 70s. It was during this time we were having a small dinner party at my home in the hills above Santa Cruz, the pot farm. It was November, and a big northern storm was approaching, so you understand that the sky had those high-altitude, think, altostratus clouds. It was dark out as my friend and I went to the backyard to talk art stuff. Oh, by the way, that, that friend, if you're out there listening to this, Carl, it's Carl Klasmeyer. He lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico now. <clears throat> a very competent artist, if you want to get a hold of him and confirm this stuff. Anyway, back to the story. As we talked, we both witnessed a UFO that was two-thirds the size of the sky appear overhead and towards the horizon. It was emitting a bluish-green fluorescent color as a large circle with spokes that spread out from horizon to horizon. I mean, this thing was huge, like the big UFOs in the movie Independence Day. As it moved towards us, it was also rotating slowly, so the spokes of the light moved across the skies. We saw this as powerful light emitting through the dense upper level clouds. In other words, the actual craft was not visible, only this powerful outline of spokes of light emitting from the craft through the clouds as it moved from the distant horizon to right overhead, and then it just went out as if someone turned the switch off. This is how that eventful night began. Other phenomena also began to occur and continued throughout the entire night. And that was a slowly occurring, very bright, bluish-green fluorescent light from a single source glowing, growing slowly so that it finally got so bright it lit the entire sky, even casting shadows from behind the clouds as it would outline the nature of those clouds during its peak brilliance. And slowly it would then fade. So clearly this was not lightning. <coughs> as we went back inside and told everyone what we saw, of course they did not believe us. W would you? But they did witness this other strange phenomena of this weird bluish light that from time to time would occur, and it frightened everyone, and everyone decided it best to go home. That included me driving my friend and his girlfriend home. They lived in Live Oaks across the street from the beach bluff. When we arrived at the beach house, we discovered all the lights were on. Okay, music. We need like that uh, um, Dark Shadows music. Okay, here we go. I discovered all the I discovered all the lights were on, all the windows and doors wide open. This caused some alarm. So we entered the house cautiously. We discovered the cat in the middle of the room, all puffed up, growling, eyes dilated, and the cat had defecated on itself. This caused even greater alarm. I like that Dark Shadows music. <laughs> Shortly after discovering the cat, the house began to shake like into an earthquake, and at the same time an intense fluorescent bluish green light began to stream into the windows at an oblique angle to the window as though the light was coming in a similar fashion as sunlight would around noontime. As this continued, the angle of the light was such that it began to fill more and more of the room, as though the source of light was slowly and deliberately moving closer to the ground. During this event, I went to the back door, holding onto 
the door jam, I hung out to look up. What I saw was a circular craft about 300 feet in dimension with a center orb of light surrounding by five more orbs of light contained within the bottom of the craft with the orbs being the source of light. While gazing at the curiosity, my mind could hear or feel, to be more accurate, to let go and come with them. It was at that point my soul screamed and recoiled as I called out to God and withdrew back into the house. At this point, the craft immediately shot straight up at such velocity that it took with it all the power lines from the adjacent telephone pole and several large limbs from a large live oak tree that was in the backyard. We immediately left or fled back to the ranch where I lived and we stayed up most of the night watching the skies. Now, I don't think I've mentioned it here. When that wheeling was coming, when I was hanging from the door jam looking up there, the hair on my neck hackled. I could just fear, heal, I could feel like waves of just cold permeating fear. I knew that what this was was not aliens. I knew that what you would call today that these were interdimensional demons. This was demonic. And they were trying to get through to me. Thank you, Jesus, I didn't go. All right. That night, a power failure occurred from Monterey to Santa Cruz East all the way to Lake Tahoe. A few days later, I received an anonymous phone call from a woman I never figured out who she was, who said she was a psychic, that the craft I witnessed was called the Starship Jules Run. Isn't this weird? I mean, I get this phone call from somebody I don't know. How do they get my phone number? And she told, tells me that the captain's name was Hilarion from the Palladi Star System. She further instructed me to go to San Jose to the Rosicrucian Temple. Well, I didn't know what the Rosicrucian Temple was. I was naive. Uh, you know what the Rosicrucian Temple is, right? It's the Illuminati. And asked to be allowed to the basement, and Captain Hilarion would contact me there. So I did. I went. Captain Hilarion was a no-show. This whole episode threw me into a search for God, for answers into study and from that day on I have been seeking and studying. I had another overdose shortly after this event. This time it was from overdose on snorting coke and drinking vast amounts of vodka one night. Oh my generation. <laughs> While doing my artwork. I have an obsessive personality complex so it was totally self-inflicted. Rebellion of sorts. Well, not really rebellion of sorts. Absolute full-blown rebellion. I was so out of control and full rebellion during this era of my life. Just thought to throw this in there in case you had not noticed. I would have died from a total heart arrest had my friend Tom Robinson not been there. He, a far superior drug abuser, knew what was happening and put me into a freezing cold shower, made me drink some herb concoction, and my heart came back and I lived. <laughs> Two weeks later, I was at my desk doing my artwork. I had a very unusual Holy Spirit visitation. This was more like a warning. It made me sweat cold and tremble, it made me nauseous with the intensity to leave immediately. It was like God stuck his finger into my head and he said to me, stop doing the drugs, sell everything, pack it up and go now. Yes, sir, I did. The next week after selling everything that would not fit into my Fiat 124 station wagon, I left for Washington State and I never looked back. In fact, I stopped communicating with everyone I knew in Santa Cruz. I basically just disappeared. Then I went about seeking a new livelihood and to get away again from the drug culture. I moved to Whidbey Island in Washington State and took most of the money I had and bought up a lot of fossilized ivory, mastodon mostly, and went about making museum quality scrimshaws with it. After a full summer of building up an inventory, I headed out to Seattle to sell it. I had less than $5 to my name when I headed for the ferry. When I arrived to Seattle, I parked in front of the first art gallery on the first street on First Street, gas tank totally empty, put my last coins into the meter and walked in totally on faith as I was now totally dead broke. My work was well received, and I walked out of that first gallery with over twenty thousand dollars and future orders for work in excess of fifty thousand dollars. Can you believe that? I continued going from gallery to gallery and came home with over $50,000 in my pocket and over $100,000 in future orders. To say I was elated was an understatement. I was humbled for the, for the time being. 
Did I give God thanks? Yes, I did. But I still had a long road to haul. For many years during this era, I made an average of 20000 per month until the era of high interest rates in the late 70s hit. That story continues later on. My point of this story was the direct order from God I had received, and I listened to it, and I was not only rewarded, but I avoided prison for life. Let me explain. Years later, many years later, I returned to Santa Cruz and looked up a few friends. I found out most of them had gone to prison and many for life. These were the people that I was their direct supplier of the drug chain. Less than a month after I had left, the sting off went into action. Within six months, everyone in my network was arrested and convicted. In fact, the rumor for a time was I turned them in. Later, I was exonerated for that. Divine intervention? I, I think so. The latter part of that era on Whidbey Island was pretty uneventful as far as spiritual events go. Life was good. I was plowing in the money as an artist for the first time in my life. I finally got a social security number and was making a good living away from the drug culture. Then the recession hit, you know, the Jimmy Carter recession. Order stopped for my work, money ran out, and I headed south to San Francisco as I had a vision to start a design and advertising agency. So here we are in San Francisco. My little shop in the back of a warehouse grew as I acquired new customers in the electronics industry. It was 1984 and I had a small design and ad agency It was picking up customers. Brand new companies like Apple, yep, the Apple back when I met the Steves and they had a total of maybe 20 employees at a place in Cupertino called Taco Towers. This is where I met my first wife. She worked at one of my clients. We got married and ran the company together. By 1988, we were doing over $2 million per month. We were also burying ourselves in debt. We had new big BMWs, fancy home in the San Francisco Peninsula, Rolex watches, fancy vacations, Brook Brothers suits, ballet shoes, you know all the trappings of a capitalistic material wealth oriented shallow life. And I was doing a good job. It also created many challenges. One was the constant lawsuits caused by my perceived wealth and the constant issues with employees. Never on time, false work comp claims, auditing from the state of California, more lawsuits to collect from clients that just ripped us off. One such lawsuit was between two employees that stole my proprietary information and then competed against us. That lawsuit cost me millions, lasted two years, and ended in a mistrial and we settled out of court by just walking from each other on Friday, October 14th, 1989. The following Monday, I discovered my office manager, who basically ran the operation during the lawsuit, had been bezeled all the money from the company and even used the line of credit, and by doing so also wiped out the equity in my home. <laughs> I was basically insolvent. That day came to an end at 5.04 when we were hit with the Loma Prieta earthquake, which brought the ceilings down in our office, collapsed the Bay Bridge, pancaked the Cypress Freeway in Oakland, and burned the Marina District. Yeah, that earthquake. It also rang in the Greatest Recession prior to the Great Recession of 2008 in California. Oh, a, a, a note here. Uh, those of you who know what a Shemitah is, 1989 was a Shemitah year. Interesting, huh? So everything began to die in California after that earthquake, as far as the way things were. I often suspected that earthquake had some type of judgment. It caused a pale over people. Several of my employees quit and moved out of California. That agency never recovered. Even though I did dig the agency out of the debt load caused by the embezzlement, we moved to humbler locations. Eventually, I shut the agency down and took the remaining profitable business home with me to work from home as a freelancer ad agency. It was a smart move as this was moving me towards being a home-based business from then on and doing so. We were back in profit, but the writing was on the wall, staying in California, so we moved to Washington State. Even though Washington State was eventful in many ways, not much in the realm of spiritual things to really report other than the miracle healing, and that is huge. Read on. We had moved to the same city my wife's dad lived. This was an alcoholic family, and that just brought on the chronic drinking. And this is where I discovered that I had a drinking problem. I was married to it. By this time, we had two children, and the stay in Washington lasted from 1990 to 1995 when we moved to San Diego. 
mostly because the weather drove my first wife into depression as well as into increased drinking, and I was the subject of her mental and physical abuse. Yes, I was an abused husband. The one huge event that did occur while living in Washington was my first wife was diagnosed with gallbladder cancer. It metastasized, and the liver was failing. Her liver had swollen. She had severe yaundice. Her skin was the color of a school bus, and the whites of her eyes were orange. She could not even keep down melting ice chips, and her urine was the color of black coffee. The doctors had sent her affairs, and the doctors had sent, where did I go? The doctors had sent her home on a Friday to get her affairs in order, which means go home to die. Note, she worked for the Lutheran Church in Olympia called Gloria Day. Pastor Rue was her boss. That church did have a prayer circle of around 25,000 people, members. And I do know he said he was calling them in for her benefit. That Sunday, my first wife woke me up with hysterical laughter. The sun was just breaking, and I was not expecting hysterical laughter from her. She had lost all her body fat, looked like a skeleton, the color of yellow, yet here she was laughing away. I asked her what was going on, and she explained someone or something was tickling her all over her body. Uh -huh. So I lowered the sheets, and sure enough, what I saw was hundreds of invisible fingers pulling and pushing her flesh from her neck to her feet. For over an hour, this continued as we both were overcome by hysterical laughing, then hysterical weeping, back and forth, back and forth, then it stopped. We were exhausted. Right after it stopped, she asked me to go to Burger King, order her two double cheeseburgers, large order of fries, an apple turnover, and a large chocolate shake. So I did, and returned to deliver her the meal. She literally wolfed it down. Later that week, she had blood tests, normal and healthy, an MRI scan, reported a healthy, normal liver and gallbladder. By Friday, the doctors were all in wonderment, and she was back to vibrant health, shining hair, her full body weight back, and very grateful that God had restored her. Interesting note, many years later, we should divorce, and she would go back into full rebellion against God and embrace talismans and New Age reincarnation doctrine and alcoholic drinking. Shortly after that, she wanted to move to San Diego, so we put the home up for sale. Once it sold, since I was self-employed, <coughs> came the bank loan fiasco. And here's where I think I crossed the line into my true relationship with God and faith. You see, I knew the banks would not loan to me because I was self-employed. Going against my best judgment, lacking faith and push to make a loan happen, I forged my tax returns to look like I made more than I really made. Everyone was telling me, Go ahead. Everyone does it, particularly my wife and the real estate agent. I was sick of this. I was sick of the materialism and the constantly pushing for bigger cars, bigger debt, bigger homes, more money. I was just sick of the drinking. And I decided after I packed the home and was hitting the road to call the mortgage broker and told her to tear up my loan application as I had lied and just had to walk the narrow path. She was surprised and the owners were extremely angry. I was a liar and a forger, but the forms had not been submitted yet, and therefore I was not a criminal. Thank God. This was an important milestone in my life. I was learning what faith really meant. I decided if I could not buy this house based on the truth, I did not want it. This didn't go over very well, by the way. This was the first fissure that began the end of my marriage. This decision opened my mind to a lot of other vile offenses I thought was okay, because we all did them. Lying and cheating on invoicing a client, switching price tags at Ross store, using the tagger gun. Uh, my wife had a small retail shop to put price tags from other garments on old ones and return them, dis return them. disconnecting the mileage reading on the BMW so it didn't show the real mileage. These were common acts my first wife and I did and claimed to be Christian. <laughs> Amazing. After I repented with the home loan fiasco, I put my foot down, stopped the price tag game, became aware of my lying and fought it and repented. I started seeing all of this hypocrisy and it drove me crazy. I found it everywhere in my life and the purge began. Slow at first, but it began. I had gotten lazy. 
didn't want the confrontations with my wife. So for many years, I sank into layers after layers of sin, depression, despair, self-loathing, and was numb to it. Something had to change, and it did when we moved to San Diego, as I began to awaken to what Matthew 7 truly meant, and I was guilty. This is around 1996. This is when I started building a vision I had been given to make an automated marketing system on the internet. It is another great story how this all came to be, but I must interrupt here to share a story of answered prayers. Shortly after moving to San Diego, I began building the system to become known as automated marketing, the first of its kind, called Wave 4, that eventually became known as Veritech. It was an inspired work, and that inspiration continues to this day. Well into building this system, Veritech 1996, I was running out of money. I had no job. The wife worked at the Lutheran Church, a little pay. I had no receivables as I was not running a for hire design or development agency. I was building a subscriber based system and it was far from completion. The MLM company I was master distributive of called OneSource had just crashed and burned and we were about to default on the mortgage. The electricity and phone were days away from being shut off. We were in dire straits. Out of the blue, a voice said, pray to your father for help. Pray for money. I felt that praying for money was so carnal. But then I was building a system from divine inspiration for the little guy and gal, a philanthropic endeavor that God had inspired me to do, so therefore I gave it a shot. I had read how Jews prayed in the Old Testament, so I took my suit jacket off, got down on the floor in my office in a prone position, and began praying. I cried to my father for money. I prayed. I rolled around. I cried more. After all, this was his project, and if he wanted it built, then I needed money. So I cried out for money as I prayed like a holy roller rolling on the floor of my office. Are you laughing at me yet? <laughs> well, then I got up and brushed off, sat down at my desk feeling somewhat spent when a knock came at the door. So I opened the door, and in comes my friend Norm Turgeon with $2,000 in his pocket and hires me to build a client net database management system for his new visions business that's the kind of stuff I was building for just for me I wasn't like offering it out or advertising it but he knew about it so just as he was leaving after giving me the 2000 comes his friend Jose Arden I think and he had two thousand dollars cash and he wanted me to build him a website now folks I, I, I've known for my creativity and my ability to do this stuff but I did not have a sign out there and I wasn't publishing or advertising to do this stuff. These guys, all within an hour, came in and did this. So I said, of course, and as he left, along came my friend Jim LaBarge with $2,000 and hired me to build a website. Well, within a couple of hours, 13 of my friends and associates had come to my home office in my garage, and every one of them gave me $2,000, not 1500 or 2500 2000 to build this or that. They were actually running into each other as they were coming and going. Within two hours, I had the mortgage covered and all the bills paid and enough to keep us going for six months. $26,000 just showed up like that, unsolicited, right after that prayer. God was getting my attention. A similar incident to this happened again several times while building Veritech. I'll share those in sequence as the story unfolds. When we moved to San Diego, we started attending La Jolla Lutheran Church the classic rich country club church. But when I entered the doors of that church, I clearly felt the presence of God there, and this is where things started to happen. I became pretty active there, for I was thirsty and hungry and was seeking the truth. One day as we pulled into the church parking lot, there was a used, dirty, funky old 1978 tan Pontiac in the corner of the parking lot. Curious, I ventured over to see who the disgusting, dirty street people were. There were a handful of them. Oh my, how my wife just screeched at me to stay away from them. She stomped off with the young children in tow to the church, disgusted in me. This was the day I met Frankie Gillespie, a retired Mafia Sicilian hitman. Can I say that here? No worries, he is since dead. Who had been released from prison because he was dying from skin cancer. There were some other undesirables there as well. I thrust out my hand and introduced myself and invited them to attend church services and the breakfast that followed. 
I knew the food would entice them. They followed me into church. They were dirty, smelly, sick, lost members of the human race. I found myself serving the Lord, and I loved these people. Eventually, Frankie started attending Bible study with us in the living room of the church upstairs. One night, with about ten of us there, including the pastor, my wife, many of my friends, we had a full-blown Holy Spirit visitation. Time basically stood still. The sound of the city and busy road outside hushed. The light became golden and that ivory soap-like fragrance filled the air. Everyone recognized this and many were looking around at each other stunned. Now you can go out there and look for uh, um, the Clum Vets, uh, Therese Lamb, there's many other people uh, who I've lost touch with but you know, you, we could find them. They will attest to this happening. You know, this is amazing. All, all these things that happen, there's witnesses to these. So back to it. Everyone recognized this and many were looking around at each other stunned. My friend Frankie was quietly weeping on the floor as he was overcome by the Spirit and felt the love and forgiveness. I uttered the word, wow, and that ended it as fast as it came. Time came back, sound, the lighting, and the air went back to normal. But Frankie was not normal. He had been changed. He gushed out that he finally knew what Jesus was all about. He finally felt the forgiveness for his sins, especially the ones he carried as a mafia assassin. He came over to me, put my head in his hands and kissed me and hugged me crying and sobbing I really love that man the story of Frankie continues and deserves telling for it is a classic story of the broken and downtrodden versus the haughty and wealthy and trust me this church was filled with the haughty and wealthy and they despised Frankie Frankie was a World War II vet was in the Air Force Delta Force and was dropped on islands in the South Pacific during World War II. He was a decorated war vet, and when he returned, he lived in New York and Chicago and worked for the mob as a wise guy. Basically, you didn't want to take a ride with Frankie. He got busted in the 60s and got sentenced to life in California. Uh, he got sentenced because he refused to testify to anything, so they put him in prison for life. He got early parole due to the, he was terminally sick with cancer, and he had bottles of morphine that he injected for the pain Frankie was really a character. I really miss that guy. <coughs> I asked the church, and they agreed to let him live in the upstairs apartment and be the night watchman and janitor of the place in return for a room and board. Frankie became very close to me and my son. The church royalty, you know, the wealthy hypocrites, did not like this new arrangement. I thought this was extremely ironic, being everyone in the church was praying for a revival, and that pastor often predicted that the train of revival was about to arrive, Pastor Mark. As they continued looking for this phantom train, I would often inform the pastor the train had arrived that day Frankie got saved. And what everyone was looking for, they were blinded to because that revival arrived as Frankie Gillespie. It didn't take long. The pastor of the church president called me and asked me to meet with me regarding Frankie. Now, before I go into this, you must also know that the church president is a big wig politician and CEO of a big company. His 19-year-old son at the time was a heroin addict in recovery. Now, back to the meeting. At this meeting, the president guy and the pastor told me Frankie was trying to sell his morphine to the kids at the church. And they told me they wanted me to tell Frankie to move out and go away. Well, I didn't fit with me. I brought up the Ninth Commandment in regards to falsely witnessing against another. They would have nothing to do with it. They refused to face Frankie and accuse him and let him explain. They refused to tell me or Frankie who told them he tried to sell morphine. Sorry this is taking so long, but it is key to my life. So on my door steps at my house, I told Frankie what had gone down. I was hurt over this, and I love Frankie. I love, I still love Frank, the, you know, I hope to see him in heaven, or paradise, wherever we go. He was angered, but then calmed down. He explained that the church president's son had come to him one night at the church, with the knowledge that Frankie had morphine, and offered to buy it from him. Frankie got a bit nasty with the boy and smacked him around a bit, which explained the bruises on the kid's face at church prior to and during this fiasco. I believed Frankie, as I was around him all the time, as well as my family and kids. He was truly on fire for Jesus, 
born again and doing great with his life. Even his cancer had improved. At first, I helped Frankly move into a motel until we could find a better solution for an old guy dying from cancer. This was not good for him, and it took its toll on him. We found it amusing the church pastor would not talk to him, answer his calls or call him back, yet on a daily basis, Frankie would find coupons for free ice cream on his car's window from the pastor. It was truly weird in every way. We eventually found Frankie a retirement apartment in San Diego and helped him move there. During this time, I was at church one Sunday as the pastor was talking about how Jesus healed the sick, fed the starving, helped the homeless, and was reading Matthew 25, 34 to 40, and I was compelled to stand, and I did. I even put my hand up and told the pastor to stop reading as I walked up the steps and turned to the members of the pews, pointing at them in a strong, commanding voice. I think the spirit was in me. I convicted every one of those people in the pews for hypocrisy and apostasy. I went on about their foolish prayers for revival, that the train was coming, when I then pointed out the grave violations the church committed against Frank Gillespie, violating the Ninth Commandment, and kicking him out of the church, showing no justice, but serving the almighty big buck. And as I pointed at him, then told them about his son, the heroin addict, that lied about Frank, yet gave Frank no opportunity to face his accusers, I yelled apostasy, hypocrites. I am through with this church, and if any of you stay as I leave, you are as guilty as the church president, then walked out. Ninety percent of that church left that day, and none of us returned. Frank died two months later. He was racked with the cancer, but he died to save man, knowing he was loved by friends like me, my son, some of the people from church, and Jesus. I felt the victory and was humbled by the whole affair. I learned about standing ground. I was becoming a warrior. By the way, as a young child, I always asked God if I could be a warrior for Jesus. Just thought I would add that here. A year or so later, still building the social system and not making much income as development was still occurring. By the way, Veritech took 20 years of my life and I am still learning to understand the lesson from that venture. I was in dire need again for more money to be able to pay the bills and keep living. I knew God knew my needs, but I started praying over it again. Not the rolling on the floor praying, just quiet praying. Boom! A few days later, I get a phone call. It is an attorney who represents a client that wants to buy one of the many domains I own. He says they were offering $50,000 for it. Really? $50,000? I agreed and had a $50,000 cashier check via FedEx in my hands the following day. Unbelievable! A year later, my mom fell ill with a stroke and pneumonia. She fought for six weeks in the hospital, and I visited her every day. My mom, <coughs> hospital, and I visited her every day. My mom, as weak as she was with the alcohol when we were growing up, and as betrayed as we were that she did nothing while we were being molested, she was also facing her demons and fears and realizing that I totally forgave her and we became good friends until the end. She died in my arms at the hospital intensive care. She had expressed her wishes not to be kept alive by machines and had a living will to enforce this. The last day she was lucid, she held my hands as we said goodbye and we both cried tears. They were more, they were more about love tears because we both had grown strong in our faith in Jesus, but also because I saw into her deeper than I think anyone her entire life. She looked back and the love in her eyes was so clear. Have you ever looked into someone's eyes that knows they're going to die? I have. The next day, the doctor called to come to the ICU as my mom was going to be unplugged. She had slipped into coma right after I left the previous day. My sisters were there, Anne, my baby sister, and Carol, the older one. I slipped my arm under my mom's head and held my sister's hands as they held hands with the pastor at the foot of the bed. As I began to sing Amazing Grace to my mother, the room filled with the Holy Spirit. The light turned golden, the time stopped, the sound hushed, and the air became sweet like clean sheets, soap, and roses like ivory soap. I sang with great bravado, belting out my mom's favorite song, Amazing Grace. The Holy Spirit just roared with love, and she died in my arms. The story just breaks me down every time I tell it. I just cry uncontrollably. The spirit was so strong. 
As I finished singing, the Holy Spirit effects faded and the sound of the ICU came roaring back. The light became harsh again. The smell of alcohol and ether returned. My mom shared that room with another woman. I know not who she was, but she was quietly sobbing and shared with us what she saw when my mom died. She explained that she saw angels come from the ceiling and gently lift my mom up and take her away with them. She soon after telling that story called the pastor over and accepted Christ as her savior. One last victory for my mom in this world. Then the doctors and nurses came streaming in. They were filled with wonder. They experienced the air turning sweet and the lighting turning gold and the hush of the sound. They were stupefied as they asked us what had happened. All I could tell them is the Holy Spirit had been present for my mother's passing. My dad died a year after my mom died. He had been divorced from my mom for 30 some years. I was not there when he passed. It was somewhat uneventful, and that saddens me. My dad died from Alzheimer's disease, but I do have a last story about my dad, too. Maybe it has connections to God's great love and grace, maybe not, but it is worth spending the tale over. You see, my dad was not very kind. He was mostly angry. He was closed up and never shared anything. I never really knew my dad much other than the stinging side of his punishments as a kid. Two weeks before he died, I and my little family were spending the day up in the San Diego mountains in a small tourist town called Julian. We unexpectedly ran into my dad and his wife and my older sister, so we had dinner together that evening in Julian. My dad's Alzheimer's was advanced and he thought I was his brother during World War II and we shared our plates of food with each other as he talked and talked about the war, World War II, and his experiences, the beach landings, the details, as if it had happened yesterday. I just went along as if I was his brother. I got to know my dad better in those two hours than the rest of my life growing up combined. I saw my dad as a giving man who risked his life to save wounded men that had been shot and shrapnel on the beach as he ran out onto the beach from his ship and carried them back to the landing gate. I heard his concerns about Hitler and the future of the world and America. It was a gift and it is the greatest memory I have of him. Two weeks later he died in surgery. I miss him, but I knew him. How are you doing? I know this is taking longer than expected, but you know, as you write, stuff is recalled, a detail surface, so hang on, it just gets better. And here, I want to put in a note. Earlier on in the story, back when I was living in San Diego, um, probably living with my, uh, with my mom, Oh, I got interrupted. Sorry, where was I? Oh, yeah, around the time, my, my brother was living in Pacific Beach, and I was down there visiting him, and I asked her projected. I didn't even know what it was, and I, I forgot to mention that in the story, though that is a uh, supernatural or a cult event. I was sitting in his living room, and his roommate Paul was outside shaping a surfboard. Um, I was kind of bored. My brother was in his back bedroom with his girlfriend. Who knows what they were doing? But anyway, the, uh, the next thing I knew, I was floating in the room. I was on the other side of the room, kind of like up into the ceiling, looking down at myself. And um, I was able to, able to travel around and look through walls and stuff. And it only happened, you know, occurred for, I don't know, two or three minutes, it seemed like. And then I was back in my body. But it was as clear as the day is long. I had no idea what it was years later when I heard about astral projection. There was that gossamer kind of like energy th thread coming from the core of my body out to my image or wherever I was that was astral projecting. Anyway, I thought I'd mention that. It's kind of weird. I even did that. All right, next up. Near the end of 1999, a successful friend of mine comes to me with an offer to use our company to produce the needed tech for a public reverse merger idea he had. This idea interested me so we could garner more revenue to build this vision I had, so I moved forward with it. Long story short, the reverse merger is being conducted by mafia types and the attorney in charge has been barred for, for criminal securities fraud from such activity. And at the same time, I find myself getting demoted at every turn from vice president to chief operating officer to general manager to assistant engineer. You get the picture. I discover this is actually a big illegal Ponzi type scheme from my research on who these guys were and I could tell what they were doing. And I share this research with my friend. I don't want to use his name. Um, and he tears up the contract, gives me the web server, and $50,000 and all my tech back, and apologized. 
So what happened in a matter of three months, we got our first server and another $50,000 to keep the vision going. Well, kind of strange, right? So about the same time as the other two previous stories, again, Veritech was in financial stress. We had to expand our hardware and our data center, and we made a loan for $1 million for the equipment as well as a long-term hosting agreement with Nonstop Net. This was based on us growing in the curve we had for about six months. So $25,000 $25, per month was our commitment. Right after we signed this deal with Nonstop, they accused us of spam um, without any basis for it, but still, they did it, and they shut our service down for three weeks while we scrambled to prove the accusations, accusations were wrong, and they were wrong. They did this because they were preparing to become a publicly held company, and the investors didn't like them hosting companies like ours that relied on massive mailing, as we did, but we actually were just like a Weber and legitimate double opt-in company. It was a political play on their part to garner more initial wealth in their IPO that backfired on them. Needless to say, that three-week shutdown destroyed our client base. So as we entered into the new year, I think 2001, with little revenue, and we went into past dues with nonstop, and by March, they demanded payment in full. With me so far? So we were scrambling to raise the money to save the company when we got a phone call from their attorney informing us nonstop debt just declared bankruptcy and we could have all of our equipment for free and our debt forgiven if we moved it to a new facility within a week. Well, we pulled it off and were blessed with $1 million in equipment, our past dues forgiven, about $50,000, and our new overhead with the new colo was only $1,500 a month compared to the chokehold of twenty five grand per month, and we recovered. Go back and read this again. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. Okay, so where are we? I told you about my mom and dad dying, the amazing miracles with Veritech, and now we are in 2001. So what happens next is very troubling, yet clearly God at work hammering me into a bell and a song and, well, uh, a hammer. There's a lot that leads up to this epic moment. But to keep this as short and on topic, I will dispense with the material events that led up to this and focus on the amazing thing that occurred. After 17 years of being married to a malignant narcissist, which was literally killing me, my wife at that time informed me she was leaving me and moved in with a very good friend, my daughter's horse trainer, leaving me with the kids. Leading up to this event, the kids and I knew something was up because stuff was disappearing from the house like dishes, silverware, tables, chairs, you know, small little things would just disappear. We suspected the housekeeper, but the children's mom was coming home later and staying out in the car talking for hours on the phone. Silly me, I never suspected until my friend Donna told me she thought she saw my wife moving into the apartment below her with my horse trainer. <laughs> it's funny how these things work. A few days later, my wife called me to come to her office at her gift shop to inform me I had to play dumb she had met another man. She didn't know I knew who he was, and they had fallen in love and she was leaving me. You cannot imagine how excited and relieved I was to hear this. She had just admitted to adultery, to leave and move out and abandon me and the kids to live with him, which, according to the Bible and God's commands, was the only possible way I was going to get out of this marriage, and here it was, handed to me on a silver platter. I was released. Praise the Lord. As I left her office and was around the corner of the building where nobody could see me, I dropped to my knees and wept tears of joy as I raised my hands up and sobbed tears of gratefulness to the Lord, and the war began. The following accounts during this divorce have to be carefully separated as the amount of spiritual battling going on now was huge, but to account for every nuance would turn just this section into a major novel alone. I was going to write a book about it, but the Lord has directed me to forgive and let that part of my life go and move on. I forgive you, Teresa. First of all, you must recognize I was in a spiritual battle with a sociopathic narcissist. This divorce is what trained me to know all too well the narcissist and how to recognize them and how to engage in battle, which raged on for about seven years. Another Shamita. So bear with me, as this part of my life left me with plenty of scars where I faced huge odds against me and experienced terrifying events. I filed a divorce in early January 2002, even though my estranged wife kept claiming to want to go to marriage counseling and save the marriage. This tore me apart, as I knew counseling and pursuing repairing the marriage was the right thing to do, especially for our 9 and 11-year-old children. So I engaged in counseling with a Christian 
or I should say a Protestant counselor. Several months into this counseling, my estranged wife told me the computer I gave her had died, and she gave it back to me. Okay, this is important to remember this part here. Later, after picking it up, I took it apart and used the hard drive to fix another computer. And when I turned it on, it booted up off that hard drive to her old operating system. I was not sure which drive this was because I have many, so I explored the files in the document folder and discovered it was my estranged wife's and noticed the letter in a folder to her attorney. Curiosity compelled me to open that letter and I discovered her strategy to lull me into counseling while she plotted to build the case against me, but needed time because I had all the advantages in divorce. So what was revealed was her true intent and from that moment on, I knew what needed to be done, and a long, nasty, engaged divorce and child custody began. But I believe the Lord wanted me to see that, so I had no misgivings whatsoever, because God wanted me free and clear from her, as he had worked for me. During this time, from 2001 to 2008 or 9, besides building Veritech, I also built a $10,000 per month income with an MLM company within three months. That is a miracle in itself. This is a, now we're, you know, this, these are Shemitas too. Fought the divorce and raised and homeschooled two children. Like I said, there were literally hundreds of small little events occurring during this time that were undoubtedly from the Holy Spirit, and this is one example of these small occurrences. I am a clean freak, but this time my compulsion to clean was off the Richter scale. I awoke early and started tearing the entire house apart, cleaning out cabinets, scrubbing down inside and out the cabinets and shelves, scrubbing the floors, and when I got to my office, I started throwing out old files and folders and pulling all the stuff gathered, which is typical in an office, and totally rearranged the office. Okay? Am I painting a good picture here for you? I was Mr. Clean on steroids. Definitely on a mission. During this cleaning mania, I came across a daisy pattern eyeglass case I had never seen before that was behind a bunch of binders and books in one of the overheads in one of my desk sections an area of storage I rarely went to so to my surprise as I opened this case to see what was in it there was at least two ounces of what appeared to be white crystal meth in a baggie and one of those glass pipes you smoke crack with well I thought maybe one of the people that worked for me occasionally left it there so I threw it away out in the dumpster uh, you know, I lived in a uh, townhouse complex, so I, I actually took this box of stuff I was throwing away out to the dumpster and tossed it, and continued with my manic cleaning and scrubbing. By the way, all the trash I was throwing out went out into the community dumpster. Yeah, see, I already talked about that. A few days later, 39 FBI agents showed up ready to bust my door in and tore apart my home and left with one computer and never told what it was about. But if they had found that meth, I would have gone to prison. I have no idea how it got there. But I suspect why I found it when I did. This is what I'm talking about. Occurred almost all the time during the huge divorce battle. I was always, I was always inspired, or visions, or intuition. I was always two, three, four steps ahead of the enemy. Always. It's amazing. Another unique incident that deserves honorable mention is my piano. I had a 100-year-old Stark baby grand. My son kept telling me the piano was making weird electronic sounds. And it's 100 years old. It doesn't have electronics in it. Finally, I heard them myself and confirmed that the piano was, in fact, bugged. So I conducted the test one night. I had a conversation and mentioned a web domain I owned. It was never hosted until the day before, and I installed advanced traffic technology and mentioned that I had uploaded really nasty pictures of my strange wife and her boyfriend near the piano. I, you know, I mentioned this as a, you know, near the piano so they'd hear it, as if I was talking on the phone. The next day her IP address and her boyfriend's IP address showed up at the site. The only ones. Nobody else was going to the site. The reason why I knew their IP addresses was they had sent me email and the headers revealed that. So it was revealed to me I was under surveillance for the most part of that divorce. What I'm saying here is these little things always happened which kept me one step ahead throughout the seven years of terror. During this time Two very clear spiritual events occurred, one a ghost and the other another Holy Spirit visitation. I had come to the conclusion many years prior to that, ghosts like UFOs are demons. Also keep in mind that throughout all of this history, I am pursuing biblical wisdom, study, research, and prayer. Thought you should hear that right about now, okay? So the ghost story, yes, I got them too. 
The Bazaar Del Mundo restaurant in San Diego, circa about 2005. My son and daughter and I love Mexican food, especially in Old Town, San Diego, and our favorite restaurant was at the Bazaar Del Mundo. One evening, while we were at a table in the back room of the restaurant, we first noticed our glasses started to behave strangely. After all, it was one of those tall spool-top tables with a high-gloss resin-type finish, and the water under the glasses could explain the erratic behavior of the glasses roaming around on the table doing figure eights and loop-de-loops and stuff. When my daughter pointed it out, I told her the very same thing. Moments later, she called my attention as her rice was being flicked into her face by an invisible fork. My son and I both watched this rice being flicked onto her at least another six times. Okay, so now I can add demons flicking rice at us at the Old Town restaurant at Bazaar Del Mundo. About a year later, I'm guessing, but I know it was February, my son and I were ta taking a walk along the ocean at the La Jolla Village along the bluffs. If you know where Boomers is, that was where. Along that walk, you have a big, beautiful, grassy area up on the bluffs surrounded by Torrey Pines, and then about 100 feet down the cliff is the beach, rocks, surf, and ocean. We were headed south past Boomers with the bluffs to my left, my son holding my hand to my right, and the ocean to our right. It was late afternoon, sunset time, and blustery from a recent storm passing. The air was rather chilly. There were uh, They were after storm mamatus clouds, lots of mist in the air for the gigantic waves crashing, and the sunset was beginning to turn everything pink. As we neared the steps that go down to the beach at the bottom of the cliffs, we both experienced a sudden rush of warm tropical-like air surrounding us as if an oven door had just opened. The sunset, the clouds, the air, the grass, the trees, everything, the cars, the buildings, immediately shades golden pink. The air became fragrant like ivory soap and tuberose, and the sounds hushed. Well, we know what that is. Immediately to my left, on the grassy fields of the bluff, amid the Torrey Pines, an older fellow with long white hair and white beard began to play his bagpipes, Amazing Grace, in the sweetest, most amazing, beautiful sound. Then right in step, eight beats off of his rendition, a woman, out of eye shot to him, with long blonde hair, wearing a long white gauzy flowing dress, down on the beach began playing Amazing Grace with her flute, and it floated above the music of the bagpipes like a dove in a concert that brought me and my son to tears as we stood there. We just stood there, wide-eyed, as time had stopped, as if the large waves had gone into slow motion as these two, out of sight of each other but clearly in our perspective, played on Amazing Grace and we were taken away on that music, tears flowing in our bubble of warmth, feeling totally loved and all was good. This was the most incredible Holy Spirit visitation of them all. As we came out of it, and warmth dissipated, as the time sped back up, as the air came back to smelling of ocean, as the musicians faded away, my son looked up at me with tears in his eyes, and he knew and even said, We just met God, huh, Dad? I answered yes, and we continued our walk as we talked about heaven and earth, the Bible, etc., I was so thankful that God had just baptized my son in the Holy Spirit in my presence. What a huge blessing. The divorce ground on. FBI raids, police raids, you had strange wife filed charges. I hired an assassin to murder her. CPS raids, children protection came filing charges. I was a meth dealer. Motions after motions, lawsuits after lawsuits. Court ordered psychological review. That cost me over $50,000. And the results were I was healthy and the estranged wife was a sociopathic narcissist. I got full custody of the kids because of that. Even thwarted an attempted hit on me. Yes, she tried to have me murdered, not the other way around. Followed by ex-cons following me all the time to threaten me. It was a total, full-scale war against me. But when it was done in 2008, I was triumphant. I saved the children, and the divorce was finally signed in August of 2009. I fought this divorce on my knees, praying for constant forgiveness for the enemy. I never took aggressive action. I only defended. I only summarized all of the seven years of terror. It was so overwhelmingly wicked. Even my divorce attorney agreed she had never seen anything like this, and I would not have survived had I not retreated to the Lord and walked in his path. This war tor turned me towards the Lord in so many ways. There is one other amazing grace within these seven years I must reveal. 
Through this spiritual war, via this divorce, I also raised and homeschooled my two oldest children, and I built the heart and soul of a company called Veritech. During this time, <clears throat> not only did I develop literally thousands of deep bonded friends, I also met my second wife, and the following is the summary of that story. Around 2003, we had built a third-party system using Veritech technology, and with that, our first web-based conference room. I often sat in that conference room to be accessible to anyone that needed assistance with using our system while I worked. So you can imagine there were others that also hung out there, kind of like family. From the room, you could communicate with others via audio, like Skype is today. So what started to occur is I made a friend named Annette. She had a most soothing voice, and I could tell she was truly a kind woman. I have to illustrate here that my heart had been hardened and turned many dark shades of black, particularly towards women, because of the war going on with my divorce and the sheer betrayal that was part of that. So entering my life was this kind, sweet woman named Annette. She became a soothing voice at random moments, but always she would call me. Her concerns were genuine. This continued on for years. As we became best buddies like pen pals of the past, we also started communicating on AOL Instant Messenger. I could clearly tell she was lonely and just wanted to be friends. She felt safe with me and she made me feel appreciated and with no agenda. This went on for about a year when I signed off from our AOL chat one day by saying, I love you. That was May 1st, 2005. It just came out quite naturally. Then I went on my way when I came home, when I checked my AOL chat, she had responded, those are big words, mister. I had to think about it, and I realized I had fallen in love with a woman totally based on her words, her voice, and her heart, which was completely out of character for me. That was a major change in my mind, and so I did the next appropriate thing. I invited her to visit, bought her plane ticket, got her a hotel room, and in June of 2005, I waited to meet her at the airport. I had no idea what I was in for, and as I waited, down the escalator came this tall, very thin, beautiful redhead with a huge smile on her face as she approached me. It was love at first sight, but there was still a long road to haul ahead of us. As I discovered, she suffered from a debilitating disease called OCD. Our relationship began, and it was whirlwind in many ways, but I knew it was something I had never thought I would experience. It was true love. This was the woman God had picked out for me, not the other way around, where I picked her. We know how that went. She left after that visit, and we were connected now, but that connection was about to become an inseparable bonding. I had her come back out again to visit in September of 2005, and on that visit, she got pregnant. Not to get graphic, as that is not my intention or style, but we had a moment of weakness, and we both succumbed. The next morning when we awoke, I knew she was pregnant. She argued that could not be, but after doing a home pregnancy test, it was confirmed she was pregnant with our daughter, Maggie. I was in rebellion. Annette was 20 years younger than me. She had a horrid OCD issue. I was still in the throes of a horrendous divorce. I fought this love off and broke up with her several times, only to come back together again. Then, when she was three months pregnant, she came to visit and started spotting. The doctor told her the pregnancy was at risk and demanded she stay in bed 24 hours a day and absolutely no traveling. Great. Annette was now bedridden to my bed, and I had to care for her, feed her, shower her, massage her, and looked after her 24 hours a day until the birth. And on June 26, 2006, Maggie was born. God, in his magnificent wisdom, glued us together with this beautiful girl, even though we still went back and forth in a tumultuous relationship, we eventually got married, and as I continue this story, she will be mentioned as she and Maggie play a big part in all of this. God sent me to the desert to be restored and to heal. The divorce was over in 2008. At the same time, the economy sank and everything changed in business. It came to me to purge my material possessions, especially my debts, and this is the year that process began and it still is in process and it's now 2015 just thought I'd add that I started by short selling my home then my RV then my cars my credit cards this took most of 2008 into 2009 to complete during that time I was inspired to move to Wyoming and get as far away from the coast California and cities as I could 
Hard to explain. I was just driven to leave. Why Wyoming? I was following orders. Wyoming, actually the Bighorn Basin, is a rather godforsaken, barren, upper-altitude desert. It is one of the darkest skies in North America with virtually no light pollution at night. The population of deer here far exceeds humans, and the town I wound up at has a population of 80 people. I now live on a 400-acre ranch up against the Bighorn Mountains, and that has changed. I have now moved into downtown Shell with a population of 80 and enrolled my son for his last two years of high school, taking him out of homeschooling in the local town, public schools where prayer was practiced, and the corruption of the big cities did not exist, and classroom sizes ranged around five students. My son did well, making nearly straight A's, lettering in football and wrestling, going to state championships, and invited and went to the boys' state in the capital of Wyoming. It was a good move for both of us. Homeschool catapulted him into this. My next big miracle occurred while living here. Shortly after moving here, I went in for a full physical in 2010, and the doctors discovered a serious cardiac artery issue. It was delaminating, and I was rushed into surgery. My life was saved, but now I had a medical bill in excess of $138,000 after insurance paid their part. I was grateful to be alive, but depressed to be back into deep debt again. Now, here comes one of those out-of-the-blue, unexpected miracles. Well, you tell me. The phone rang about six months after the surgery, and it was the hospital accounting department. I was waiting to hear the demand when the lady on the line said she was with the part of the hospital that informs people when one of their benefactors chooses a patient and pays off their bill. This was the case. My medical bill was forgiven. I did not ask for this. I did not pray for this. But I broke into tears, for I knew what this was. In 2011, I had another weird event occur. This is a strange occult event. I cannot say it was God or it was demon, but it certainly was supernatural. When we moved to the ranch in the front yard, when we moved to the ranch, in the front yard are two ornamental purple plum trees. They're 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 hard not they're hard to miss. I mean they're purple and they produce sparingly little purple plums. I know this because I recognize them as they are now one, they are one of my favorite trees. I grew up with them. The first year here, they actually produced a dozen or so large plums. I even have pictures of them. The next year, those two plum trees turned into green chokecherry trees. They changed their genus. I have no idea what the message was. I just know this occurred. I do not pray to those trees. However, I do eyeball them every time I walk near them. This is the same area I do a lot of my power prayers at. And this is where I will pray three long nights in a row for important issues. The first time I powered prayed there, was when Veritech was in serious trouble and we needed a real server tech engineer as the ones we had were basically destroying the company and Veritech was about to fall. For years, our two original engineers we had via our Colo vendor extorted us for hundreds of thousands of dollars yet never ever resolved our issues, particularly our emailing failures, which had become chronic and I was just about to just quit and shut Veritech down. After all, it was God that inspired me to build Veritech, so out I went to my prayer spot at the fence and down I would go, praying for hours, and on the third day, my phone rang. It was one of our subscribers. His name is Marius, and he asked in his broken Polish if he could help us. When I questioned him, he said he was a server engineer. So against everyone else's interest, I gave Marius the passcodes and IDs to access the servers. The next day, he called me and said he had fixed the servers and the mail was good. He then proceeded to fix everything else, and the problem stopped and Veritech was back. Marius is God sent and continues to bless us beyond words. The next year, I needed my partner Mike's assistance and attention to get things back up and to speed. You see, Mike had a full-time job at the time, and his attention was practically non-existent as during that time I ran things. But now Mike was needed, so I prayed over this for three days. If Mike could not come to our assistance, who could? That Friday, I texted Mike about my needs that I had prayed over for three days. My text crossed Mike's text to me. Crossed it. This is I sent, send, he sent, send. What did Mike text me? He had just been unexpectedly fired by the owner. Out of the blue, totally unexpected, unjustified, and now Mike was 100% available, and again, my prayer was answered. Immediately. Sorry about that, Mike. Now... Understand, I'm only sharing the really big events. Moderate and smaller things like this have now become almost daily to the point that I fully expect miracles and visions on a constant basis. Back to my new bride, Annette, whom I always assumed was a Christian. 
But due to her very extreme OCD, she never felt worthy of Christ's sacrifice, therefore never fully accepted Jesus. With love and tenderness and several years of persuasion and a lot of prayers, on Friday the 13th in 2012, she accepted the Lord. Okay, that is wonderful in itself, and it is always reason to celebrate for everyone that is saved. But this laid the foundation of a miracle and the fulfillment and my most recent Holy Spirit visitation. Around that same time, Annette was living with me and my daughter, Maggie. This had not always been the case. During our tumultuous relationship, we separated often in emotional battles, often caused by the insanity of her OCD and my drinking and emotional scars from the previous marriage and recent divorce. But regardless, we would make up and come back together, repent and pray for wisdom and healing. It was a very hot and heavy relationship indeed. She is a redhead. I'm an artist. Think Lucy and Desi, remember? While visiting my son on an occasion in San Diego at his aunt's place, he quite clearly and succinctly pointed out I was a hypocrite, being that I was living with my girlfriend, Annette, and he made his point. I submitted that he was absolutely correct, and I was in rebellion to God. The blindfold was removed. When I returned home, I informed my bride-to-be that we must get married, and until then, we must remain celibate. This we did, and nine months later, we were wed. As I walked down the aisle with my bride on my arm, tears streamed from my eyes, as I knew this woman was the one that God had chosen for me. This woman and I were about to enter into a contract of marriage with Jesus Christ. I was overcome with joy. I could hardly speak. The whole event is a blur in my mind. To find that partner, the one who is anointed to be with you, and vice versa, is the greatest blessing I have ever received from the Lord. We married, Annette, the Holy Spirit, and I. And here we are now, looking at prophecy, walking together, living on 400 acres, mostly isolated from the world, praising the Lord, working at home, homeschooling, studying in, and reaching out from our little house on the prairie, working the best we can for the Lord. Deep into study, I know that God is real. Jesus is Lord, and the Holy Spirit is very real and active in us. I know we are facing the very beginnings of the tribulations that we are clearly in the end times, that the clock started on May 14, 1948, when Israel was restored with her people. I know we are in a huge spiritual war. I feel so blessed that God has walked with me in this life of mine and chose me to reveal his Holy Spirit too from such a young age. I am also grateful for my constant struggles, disasters, and calamities as that has built a character in me and a heart of deep empathy to reach out to others like you and share this. So you know that God, that Jesus is not just a history adventure in some Bible, not just an academic argument, not a Catholic perverted religion, but is real and alive and active right now. This is what I was commanded to do after prayer to write this at this time just for you. Because the Holy Spirit said, you need to know this side of God, to know the personal reality of Jesus, to understand the implications of the spiritual battle, that it is coming to a close, and that in the new world, where Jesus sits as king, all corruption, evil, greed, idolatry, death, misery, lying, deception will not exist. Our, our tears will be attended to, our broken hearts will be mended, and we will be healed and perfect in that world in our relationship with our King. I pray, looking forward to that future, and I look there hoping that I will see you there. It is not long to that day. We are the last generation. Also important to note, I am likened to Job. Even two different pastors have recognized this in me. I have been under attack since I can remember. At about the same time the first visitation occurred, my older brother, who has showed me my entire life his absolute contempt and hatred towards me. At two and a half years, he threw me into a black paper wasp nest in the lilac bush. I almost got stung to death. I was able to outrun the majority of them, but I still got seriously stung. He is five years older than me, so he was about eight years old when he attempted to kill me the first time. Shortly after that attack, he and my older sister took me deep into the forest and then left me as they ran off screaming a bear was coming to kill me. I was lost and I have no idea how I found my way home, but I remember being terrified. My older sister is seven years older, so that would have made her almost ten years old. His and her attacks on me have never stopped, even right up to the current events of today. My point is, I am a magnet of sorts. By the way, you have been warned. 
I have even been hit twice by lightning and have had two very near hits by objects from the sky. I assume they were meteors, one missing my head by less than an inch and capsizing my sailboat at sea in San Diego. Praise the Lord. I did it, Jesus. I finally wrote it all down. My God, how I love you. Thank you.